Yeah. All right, welcome to episode, I think it's 34, of Seven Songs. Uh, we're going to be featuring horns today. Horns, that's right, that's the theme, because why not? <laughs> Song number one is by Michael Jackson. This is called Working Day and Night. Okay, this is from 1979. It's on the Off the Wall album. Um, it's the B-side, oh, there you go, yes, yes, it's the B-side of Rock With You. You all know the song Rock With You, this was the B-side, so it actually wasn't a single, and uh, they only played it, I think, on, on one tour after on, uh, Off the Wall, and it wasn't until the Jackson Brothers did their victory tour that they brought it back in a medley, which is kind of cool. Now, this tune is interesting in that its horns are double and triple tracked, I believe. So what does that mean? Well, the horn section that was in the studio, which I believe was four gentlemen, four or five gentlemen, I'm not exactly sure, would record a take, and then they would record another take, but with slightly different rhythmic variations. So it gave you this lovely, thick texture of horns and kind of made it sound like an impossible thing was happening, where these horns are playing lines on top of each other within lines. So that's the challenge of this song for a live ensemble to do it. How do you get three horn players to sound like five guys recording multiple times, like 15 guys? How do you do it? Well, we're going to show you how we try to do it and the brilliance of the authority horns. Plus, Matt back here giving a little bit of support makes it possible. So here we go. Here's We divide, we, we divide the rhythm. We divide it up amongst, we divide, yeah, we divide it up amongst the, the brass section. So trumpet and trombone have a doubled line. Sax has a line on his, on his own. And keyboards have a line on their own. And it sort of all layers together. What we're going to do, we're going to play them one at a time just to show you how it all sort of sits together. And then we'll put it all together. And then you can listen for it as it happens in the song. So Andy's going to do his first part. Which, this is sort of after the second chorus. There's this lovely horn breakdown part. It's the really exciting vibrant part of the tune. So this is what's happening in that section. So horns do this, uh, trumpet does this. Two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> okay. Saxophone does a similar, yeah, that's right. Saxophone does a similar rhythm, but it's slightly different. And sax does this. One, two, three, four. <laughs> All right, cool. Now to add a little bit of meat and protein to this sandwich, we have the keyboards, which are, have a horn sound. Just give the horn sound for a second. Which sort of doesn't sound great on its own, right? <laughs> but what's cool is if you incorporate that with live horns, all of a sudden the sound, the timbre, your ear gets fooled into thinking it's much more accurate. You add a band on top of that, and then it's really great. Whenever you go see Casey and the Sunshine Band or some horn bands, invariably there's usually a keyboard player playing the horn lines along with the horns to give it some nads, to give it some, some meat. So Matt is playing this against those two parts as well. Two, three, four. <laughs> So we're going to layer it in. That's right. Oh. It's like it's the coolest kind of like sort of chemistry that's happening or, or, or I guess, yeah, some kind of chemistry, some kind of biological thing. So what we're going to do, we're going to layer in uh, uh, first the horns, then the woodwinds, and then the keys. And we'll show you how that all sounds together. All right? So here we go. Two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Four guys sound like 16 guys. Isn't that cool? Right. Turn this off. Now, you're also going to hear during that breakdown section, whoops, yeah, during that breakdown section, you're going to hear the bass doing this really cool slappy thing. Turn that off for me, would you? Yeah. Oops, 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 oops. Here we go. Here we go. I got it. I'm just trying to turn it off. So it doesn't feedback. Equipment is our friend. There we go. Yeah, I'm turning it off. Good. So. Slappy. 
I just like messing with the camera guys so they don't know where to film me, yeah. So Vin does this cool part where he's playing an open E, right? And then, yeah, so he's using his thumb, which gives you this percussive sort of sound. And then he plucks on the string, sounds like that, as opposed to just playing it with his fingers. Play with fingers. See that soft, so you get that percussive thing here and then plucking, and he's actually, the strings are actually hitting the fretboard, and that's that funky sound that was developed by Graham, uh, Larry, Graham. Larry Graham. Larry Graham was the first guy to start sort of thumping along the Graham Central Station. He also played with uh, Sly Stone, Sly and the Family Stone. So listen for those things, especially when we get to that little breakdown section. Watch the horns blowing their brains out for you. Uh, uh, and it's just a lot of fun. Is that, is that everything? That's everything, right? Yeah, let's just play it. Let's just play it. I love it. I love it. I love it. And Bree sings the hell out of it as ever because it's Bree. Here we go. Oh, thanks.
It's the authority horns, yeah. Isn't that fun? So much fun. All right, song number two is by a band called Chicago. Which I believe they were from Texas originally. <laughs> um, this is actually the very first song that they recorded together as a band. I didn't know that. This is the very first song they recorded together as a band. It's from 1969. This is back when they were still called the Chicago Transit Authority, which was the name of the album this was on. And this is Does Anybody Know What Time It Is? Now, what I love about this, yeah, Chicago fans, yay. What I love about this is, what's that? 720? Is that some kind of weird pot reference, or what's that? Oh, it's what time it is. Oh! <laughs> Security. We're, we're two minutes behind, by the way. I'm like, I know 420, but like, that's all I know. I'm so unhip, my goodness. Anyway, yes, at 720, or now 721 probably, we're going to play this tune. Now, what I love about this song is a couple things. Number one is, uh, this is what Robert Lamb, who wrote the song, he said this. He said, I was a teenager walking down the street in Brooklyn, New York. I walked by a movie theater, and there was an usher standing outside taking a cigarette break. I said to him, hey, man, what time is it? And he said, does anybody really know what time it is? <laughs> And he thought, there's a song, and there you go. That's how most good songs happen, by a random movie usher, just, just so you know. Um, this song I particularly love because it has an introduction that has absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the song, which is kind of awesome. Like, it's, doesn't, there's no themes that are happening in that first part, in the first two minutes or whatever it is. There's nothing, the feel's not the same. It's, a, it's like this complete, it's like a sonata form on some level of, here's this introduction, we're never going to revisit this again. Not even at the end, nothing. Just, we're going to have it, we're going to confuse the audience who doesn't know what the song is until the main sort of body of the tune kicks in. And then it's like, oh, this one, I know this one. And a lot of bands that cover this song don't do the beginning part because it's a little weird and wonky. I'm going to talk you through it because the timing is very, very strange. Okay, maybe you're not a musician. For the most part, music is broken down sort of into measures that have beats in them. You can have a certain number of beats in, certain, in, in bars, in measures of music. Usually it's two, three, or four. It's kind of the way it usually works out. Duple or triple, kind of your basic thing. Sometimes you get fives though, sometimes you get sevens and weird things like that. This particular song has a couple of nice fives in there. And I'm just gonna count the bars out as Matt plays the introduction. I'll explain what's happening because not only are the bars kind of strange, but the subdivisions switch in the middle. So where your beat is here at one point, if you go twice as fast, now this is your new sort of beat and subdivision. I know it's a lot sort of coming at you. But here, Matt and I are going to just, I'm going to talk through how this thing works. So there's a couple of really fun things, but here's, here's, just the, here's just the basis, and listen to me count. Here we go. Uh, one, two, three, four, 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 five, 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 six, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, uh. What? <laughs> like, what does that have to do with the rest of the tune? Nothing, and it's fantastic. <laughs> the other strange thing that happens is there's no downbeat. What's a downbeat? That's that first beat. Normally, when you're playing, there's a big one. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two. And that's how most Western music works. What do they do? They decide to leave that downbeat empty. So, and there's no reference point. You just hear, ba 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 ba. So your brain is going to think, one and two and three. But it's not. It's one and two, three and four. There's this, there's this implied quiet one. One and two, da da da. And if you don't know what's happening, you go, wait, what's what? And as just as you're getting your bearings and thinking, oh, here's where the beat is, they go and they play in five. And you're like, ah, blah, blah. so you're walking into walls and you don't know what's going on. And then it goes from that five into a bar of six for one bar. And then it changes from this one, two, three, four, five, six, one, da 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 da, da, da to like a triple feel in four. And then it's a shuffle all of a sudden. 
it's just pure insanity, and it's brilliant, and it's so much fun to play, and I don't know why other bands don't do it, but we do it, and here it is for you. Here it is from 1969. Listen to those weird bars. Does anybody know what time it is? You hear the empty downbeat. One, two, three, four. Walking down the streets one day, a man came up to me and asked me what the time was on my watch. Oh, yeah, and I said, Does anybody really know what time it is? Does anybody really care? So I can't imagine why oh, no. We've all got time enough to cry As I was walking down the street one day A pretty lady smiled at me And said her diamond watch had stopped cold day And I said Does anybody really know what time it is? Does anybody really care? So I can't imagine why We've all got time enough to cry As I was walking down the streets one day Being pushed and pulled by people trying to Oh, oh, I just don't know, I don't know, I don't know And I said, yes, I said I Does anybody really know, know what time it is? Yeah, Does anybody yeah, really care? So I can't imagine why oh, no, We've all got time enough to die Everybody's working. Yeah, yeah. One no. Next tune, we had to do this one. We had to, well, it's hard to pick, but we had to do a Stevie Wonder song. We had to do a Stevie Wonder song. Now, do you go with Sir Duke? Well, it's, it's a pretty obvious thing. Do you go with I Wish? Well, it's pretty obvious. And I thought, you know what? We just got to go with the gold standard, which is superstition. Superstition. All right. Now, superstition, which is which the name of the song, is superstition. It's not superstitious. It's superstition. I love it when you have a set list that some, some band you're sitting in with and it says superstitious and you're like, why am I here? Why am I here? This is not, it's not gonna be good. It's not gonna be good. This tune is, is deceptive in its complexity and its simplicity. And I grew up listening to prog rock. I was a Rush, I still am a Rush fan, a Yes fan, a, a King Crimson fan, a Genesis fan. I loved all that stuff. I loved playing in seven and 13 and Frank Zappa and playing five over, five over nine and all that kind of fun stuff. And it's, I still enjoy that very, very much. When I first started playing with this, with this band, I realized it is as complex to make superstition feel good as it is to play in 17. It is as complex and as 
In some ways, playing in 17 is easier because you just mathematically do it and you eventually kind of get there. The feel of this song is so iconic that you can play the first four bars and you know what it is. Yeah, superstition. You go anywhere in the world and you play those first four bars and everybody knows what it is. What's, what's insane is Stevie was 22 years old when he wrote and recorded this song, which is just awesome. Um, the entire recording is three people. Stevie plays everything except the horns. So he's playing drums, he's playing bass, not on a bass, but he's playing bass on keyboards. There's four clav parts, I think there's an arp part as well, some other things. And then there's two horn players. Uh, um, he played, oh yeah, Honer clavinet drums and Moog bass. Moog bass. Uh, Steve Madeo played trumpet, and Trevor Lawrence played saxophone, and I think they're doubled as well. So kind of like we did in the first tune, they doubled their parts. So it's three cats are playing that song, and it sounds so unbelievably cool. There is an unimaginably awesome version, on, uh, live version they did on Sesame Street. It's 1974, I think, on Sesame Street, and they do like a, like a seven-minute version of this thing, and the puppets are going crazy. It is awesome. It's like, it's like a master class in, in not just R&B, but just feel and what you can accomplish with the song. For the most part, the song is one chord. Now, originally it's an E flat. We do it a step lower. I'm not even sure why we do it a step lower. We kind of started pr some previous singers ago. But for the most part, the bass is just laying down this sort of very simple one chord groove, which is sort of like just D, D, D. That's basically the tune. And you think, well, okay, but what happens? And it's you start layering and layering and layering. And then you have this amazing vocal that Stevie does. And then there's a cool little, little B section that happens when you believe in the things you don't understand, which is these cool chords where it goes, uh, yeah, D7. Oh, no, it's, yeah, A7. It's this little chromatic motion. So you go from being very static, yeah, very static to like these na, 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 na. Na, 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 right, Phantom of the Opera. Na, 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 Same idea. But it's still funky as all get out, and it provides this sort of relief for a second. Now, what's, what's crazy fun, what's crazy fun on this is to play the drums correctly. <laughs> and one day, I will get there. <laughs> People ask, you know, do you get sick of playing these songs? And it's like, I'll get sick of playing them when I play them correctly. <laughs> and what I literally do as a drummer uh, is I, you know, you have to picture Stevie, who is not a, not, I mean, he plays drums, but it's all feel, it's all this sort of rhythmic, rhythmic intensity and, and, and sincerity that's coming across. His technique is terrible. The guy's blind, you know? <laughs> His technique is awful, but it feels so good. So I. I sort of have to, when I'm trying to play this tune, I have to pack away my technique on some level. And I go from playing very sort of like normally, again, this might be a very subtle difference in terms of the way it comes across, but just in my head when I'm thinking. So, you know, normally to do sort of, which is very basic. But now I have, to, I have to take my technique out of it a little bit to make it sound more authentic, which means my foot's not going to be as well trained on the hi-hats here. I'm going to hold the sticks a little bit looser. I'm going to hit a little bit harder, and it's going to be a little bit sloppier. And then you just sort of picture the Stevie. I know I'm doing with respect, with total respect. I know, I know, I know, I know. It's like you're doing Eddie Murphy doing Stevie Wonder. But yeah, no, it's, it's with total respect, but it changes the thing. So I'm going to start straight-laced, and then I'm going to turn, I'm going to do my my very lame version of Stevie and just see if you can notice the difference. So here we go. It just like opens it up, right? Again, it's, I, I, know what, I, know, I know who I am, so it's all cool, it's all cool. But I'm thinking that, and I'm sure there is an equivalent that the other players are doing as well. Now, Maddie's got a very tough job because Maddie has to cover four clav parts. Be that little clav sound, just for a second. Just, yeah, that's that clav, that kind of unky, right? So it's going, I think he's going through a little bit of a wah, but there's four clavs. So Matt plays this. And keep grooving, he's grooving on that. And eventually Andy's going to add a little bit of a guitar part, which is sort of an amalgam of the other clav parts. There's no guitar in the original, but it adds this textural rhythm. 
Now, if we add bass to that, right? Now we got a tune. And now we have a little bit of Georgie Stevie. Yeah, kind of like that. So here it is from 1973 Superstition. Every superstition Writings on the wall Every superstition the ladder's about to fall Thirteen months on baby Great the looking glass Seven years of bad luck Seven times in your past If you believe in things That you don't understand And damn yourself up yeah. Superstition and the way mm -hmm. Very superstitious no Wash your face and hands Rip me on the problem Girl, do all that you can In my song. If you believe in things that you don't understand, and then you suffer. Yeah. Superstition and the way. Every superstition, nothing more the same. Every superstition, the devil's on his way. Look out, baby. If you believe the things that you don't understand, and then you suffer, yeah. Superstition and the way. No superstition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Dale with the vocal right there, come on! Love it. The, uh, so Dale joined this band as a, uh, as a trombone player uh, 404 years ago. 
And for the first 160 years he was in the band, we, we didn't know he had that voice. And it wasn't until the singer at the time was, was in a little bit of a car accident. He was fine. He couldn't make a gig. And I was frantically trying to rewrite the set, what I could sing and what we could cover and do instrumental and just play the chicken for 45 minutes or whatever we had to do. And Dale very humbly was just like, well, I can, I can sing a little bit. And so Dale ended up singing um, uh, It's Your Thing. It's your thing, do what you want to do, which is like a crazy, awesome song. And Dale starts singing, and we all were like, why is anyone else in this band singing? Nah, he's too much, but thank you very no, much. It was, yeah, I and we were like, it. dude, thank dude. You. I know. They're all expecting me to get down in the three-point stance. Yeah, that was at, uh, at the Fun House. Of all people that know the South yes. Side, that was at the Fun House. We were jammed in a corner of the Fun House. And it's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Song number four is by an artist named, uh, originally, Melissa Vivian Jefferson, better known as Lizzo. Lizzo, yes. Lizzo is amazing. She just hosted Saturday Night Live two weeks ago. She was the musical guest as well as the host. And Lizzo was the first musical guest on SNL to introduce herself. She said, ladies and gentlemen, and now, me. And she walked over to the stage, and it was amazing. She's a classically trained flute player, flautist, flautophonist, or whatever. So there is a, there, there is a real knowledge of music and music theory that's in her writing, it's, 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 but it's incredibly funky and super fun. This song was brought to my attention uh, by Ms. Info, who's here somewhere. She was, she was selling tickets for you, that's right. And uh, it was just like, I'm like, this is, this is like a hit now? This is like a modern thing? And she's like, yeah, this is like a modern thing. People under the age of 60 know this song. <laughs> I was like, but that's awesome. We should, we should totally learn it. Now, this is cool. One of the neat parts of this tune is that the bass drops in and out a lot. So in the verses, it's just basically guitar and drums. Now, the guitar has this cool little part that's playing like this. basically the whole tune. That's basically the whole song, but when you start layering, listen for where the bass comes in, where the bass comes out. Um, I have the fun job of trying to do fills while sounding like a drum machine sort of at the same time, so you can see me, I'll do these sort of fills at one point, but trying to keep two, two and four, trying to keep this happening the whole time. Which is like fun, a fun little challenge to kind of get those fills in there. And I want to teach you guys in the audience what happens in the breakdown, which is you have to say what, okay? So the, what happens there? Um, somebody better come get my Somebody right? come get this come man. man. I think he got lost in my DMs. Yes. What? what? In my, my DMs. DMs. What? So it's on the and, yeah, one, two, three, one, two, and three, four. One, two, and three. It's on the and of two, for those of you that are counting. One more time. Somebody, but yeah. Somebody come get this man. I think he got lost in my DMs. What? My DMs. What? You're yeah, a little bit early, so a little bit, is it my DMs? What? My DMs. What? My DMs. What? My DMs. What? My DMs. Ah, yes, okay, we're gonna get to that part, and you're all gonna do it, and it's gonna be fantastic. Here it is, from uh, 2019, 2019, Lizzo's album, Cause I Love You. How perfect, here it is, Juice. Shiny, everybody gonna shine. I got gold. I was born like this, don't even gotta try. Now you know. I like shining, they get better over time. So you know. Heard you said I'm not the baddest bitch you lied. It ain't, ain't my fault. fault. Yeah, yeah, blame it on my juice, blame it, blame it on my 
That's Brie right there. Now that's an example of a song that doesn't really have horns on it. There's sort of an implied keyboard lines here and there, but Andy, our intrepid horn arranger, wrote that arrangement, which shows how you can add to a song without necessarily taking anything away or being too intrusive, but it just makes it so much funkier and so much more fun to play. So, well done, sir, as ever. All right, song number five, we move on. Now, this is a little bit complex. This is a, this is a cover of a cover. So we're playing a version of a song that was played by someone else doing their version of another song, all right? It's kind of like an egg roll, pretzel, twisty kind of thing. Uh, the song is Pick Up the Pieces, originally done by the Average White Band. That's right, very good, five points. Average White Band is a, yeah, that's right, Scottish funk band. That's right, that's right. They're from Scotland, and they were tremendously successful in the 70s. And they had this song called uh, Pick Up the Pieces. Now, Candy Dolfer, who is a brilliant sax player, she's an amazing, amazing sax player, she toured with Prince for a long time, uh, has her own vibrant solo career. In 1993, she had an album called Sax A Go Go, and she did her version of Pick Up the Pieces, which uh, way back we heard that and we thought, oh, that's a really, really cool arrangement. It takes the original and shifts some things around, shifts some parts of the song around a little bit, changes not so much the chords, but the feel just a little bit, but it still has the essence of the song. And it's a, just a fun, funky, groovy song. There's no, there's no vocal, it's, it's an instrumental, so we're gonna feature the horns, and especially we're gonna feature Kyle on a saxophone solo that happens. What's super cool is during that solo, you hear the band will be doing what are called sort of tutti hits. Tutti is Italian for together or everyone. So when, when you see something that says tutti, you know that's sort of together. So we have, listen for these hits that are happening, bop, 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 and we're outlining it. The whole band is outlining these hits. It gets more and more complex as the solo goes on, and even at one point, there are hits that go across the bar. So you have like your measures of, measures kind of being played out. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. If you play a triplet, over those bars, you get this uh, 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 so one, two, three, four, bam, 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 It's really cool, you get this two against three sort of polyrhythm subdivision thing, but it's chromatic at the same time, so we're back at the Phantom of the Opera for a second. We're doing that, and it's just, but it's all in support of the sax solo. So listen for all those really, really fun things. At the very beginning, if you want to yell, pick up the pieces, feel free. Here we go, one, two, Three, everybody say, pick up the pieces. Come on. Pick up the pieces. Pick up the pieces. Pick up the pieces. Woo! 
like it like that. Give me some more, yo, he gotta give me some more. Yo, he gotta give me some more, yo, he gotta give me some more. Yo, he gotta give me some more, yo, he gotta give me some more. Kyle on the saxophone. So much fun. Oh my gosh. We got two left. Here we go. This next <laughs> this next one is done uh, by uh, a very obscure soul singer. Uh, her name is Aretha Franklin. I don't know if you ever heard. Yeah, yeah. This is perhaps Aretha's funkiest tune, I, I think one could contend, which is saying something. But this is definitely your funkiest tune. And for the most part, of this, it's just one chord, which is, which is insane. It's one chord. The form is very strange. But at one point, it does go to a second chord. It goes from an A to a D. So it goes from a one chord to the four chord. And when the four chord happens, the horns come in and they play, and it's this sense of euphoric release when the horns come in. We, we're, we had a conversation once after a gig about why does it feel so good when that happens? Because it's not, harmonically, it's not really that complex what's going on, and we got into a debate of which key is it. Maybe the song is actually in D, and we're going back to the one chord versus going back to the five, which is an A, but unless you're an A, that's the one on the four. It was this whole thing. This is what happens at two in the morning when you're wrapping cables. This is what happens. <laughs> we couldn't figure it out, but we got to this point where we just didn't care. We just knew it felt so good. I want to show you, so give me the A. Just This is sort of the main, the main groove. <laughs> We're sort of in this P here, and then we go to the four, to D. And the horns come in. This is what the horns play. This is what the horns play the second time they come in. It's just this really lovely extended line that brings us back to the one chord. So here's the horns. One, two, three, four. <laughs> I 
again, nothing crazy harmonic going on, but it just feels, it's like this, um, it's like a regal almost, almost fanfare that sort of is happening of like, hey, we're going to the four chord. Yay, Aretha's the queen, fantastic. Our part that starts this is another one of these kind of like the Chicago tune where you don't really know where one is. So just start playing it. There's so much space. You're not We're gonna start it, and we're gonna play this tune. This is from yeah, this is from 1972. The uh, uh, the album was called Young, Gifted, and Black, and uh, this is uh, Rock Steady, Aretha Franklin. Make it funky, baby! Come on. Right there. Authority horns right there. All right, for song number seven, we're going to do the most famous horn song that doesn't have horns in it. <laughs> have you ever heard of the song Call Me Al by Paul Simon? Yeah. The very first thing you hear in that recording from Graceland, the brilliant Graceland album, is a guitar synthesizer. 
There are no horns playing in the beginning. Later on in the song, there are some horns that are added. But that very first thing you hear, whap, 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 that is Adrian Ballou from King Crimson, from Talking Heads, from David Bowie. Uh, he's playing his guitar synth, a very early rudimentary guitar synth, and he's playing the horn part for Call Me Al, which is so crazy. I'm going to show you what we do to kind of simulate that synth. So the horns are going to play what they play first, and then much the same as we thickened the horns in the Michael Jackson song, uh, Matt's going to play along with it. So this is what the horns play at the very introduction. For the record, we're actually playing the part of Chevy Chase. Oh, you're playing the part of Chevy Chase. Okay. <laughs> Sweet. That's true. That's true. So here's the, here's the intro. Another one with an open downbeat. One, two, three, four, one. <laughs> What Matt does, give a little, just a taste of that little synth sound. Right, there it is. And all of a sudden, it sounds like this. All together, one, two, three, four, one. And you've got a guitar synth happening. Now this is perhaps the, the uh, highest charting song to feature a penny whistle solo of all time, which of course is played by Matt brilliantly over there on the keys. It sounds really, really cool. There's a couple little drum things here that are interesting. A lot of, a lot of bands sort of at our level that do this, a lot of drummers sort of play the part strangely. It's, it's, a, it's a simple complex part in that there's no real two and four happening. There's no, there's no one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It's a lot of this, one, two, three, four, this clicking that's happening. I'm doing these rim clicks all the time. So, and I go to a wedding and someone starts playing Call Me Out and it's like, no, it's not the part. You're not playing the part right. No, it's not the part. They start doing it. It's like, yeah, that's, that's, that's not the part. That's not the part. That's not the part. But it's fun and it's fun. It's, you'll see me, uh, people ask, why do you close your eyes when you sing? And very often when I'm playing, and singing, I close my eyes. In this song in particular, there are so many words in this song that if I, my eyes are open and I just notice and I just go, oh, that person has a white sweater on, <laughs> the words are gone. <laughs> so all four limbs are doing something and I'm trying to remember the words and trying to be somewhat on pitch and do the whole thing and if I open my eyes and I go, oh, those are really cool frames. <laughs> gone. So I close my eyes, not because I don't want to be here, but because I want to play it correctly. The cool thing that we do with this particular song is one day, I forget who, but one of us noticed, like, wait a minute, this song is an F, and the Paul Simon song, Late in the Evening, is also an F. So what we do at the end after, the, okay, the bass solo, we do that, yeah. After the bass solo happens, whoa, you all right? We good? All right, sweet. Um, after the bass solo happens, we go into Late in the Evening, which is uh, another Paul Simon song that features horns. What's cool about that particular tune, Steve Gadd played drums on that song. And what Steve Gadd does, this is another thing that a lot of wedding band drummers don't get quite right, is he uses four sticks in that part. So he goes from playing with two sticks to doing four, and he does what's called like a Mozambique, sort of a poor man's Mozambique pattern, which is like an African pattern. So I, I do that, and it's tremendous fun. While Vinny's doing his little, his little bass run, which we'll get to in a second, I switch over and I play with four sticks. Why would I play with four sticks? Well, all of a sudden now, instead of just hitting one surface with one hand, now I can hit two surfaces with one hand. And I can hit two surfaces with the other hand or hit a single drum with two sticks that make it sound like two people are playing. You also get that cool rim click as opposed to single click with two sticks, you get that click. So you go from doing something like, like this, having it sound like this. That's cool, yeah. That's Steve Gadd, that's not me, that's Steve Gadd, and it's just, it's just, it's so effective and so neat. Now, the bass solo. The bass solo, perhaps one of the most famous bass solos, which also, just like the horns, aren't real in this tune. The bass solo isn't really real either, because the bass solo is the first half is played normally in front. 
Then they took the tape and they flipped it and they put it on the tail end and it goes backwards. So it goes So If you listen to it, you hear the notes go from boom to zip. So what poor Vinny has to do is he has to try to emulate that. Here's the first half of the the first half of the solo. And then he basically takes those notes and then plays them backwards and goes back up the neck, trying to make it sound as if he's playing backwards, like this. Right? It's so cool. It's, it's, it's literally impossible to do, and Vinny does it. All right? Here it is from 1986, uh, as well as from 1980, because that's late in the evening, from the album Graceland. This is called You Can Call Me Al. Here we go, song number seven. One, two, three, four, one. down the street he says why am I so soft in the middle now why am I so soft in the middle the rest of my life is so hard I need a photo opportunity I want a shot of redemption don't want to end up a cartoon in a cartoon graveyard bone digger bone digger dogs in the moonlight far away my welded door Mr. Beer Belly, Beer Belly get these mutts away from me you know I don't find this stuff amusing anymore you be my bodyguard, I can be a long lost pal. I could call you Betty, Betty when you call me, you could call me out. A man walks down the street, he says, why am I short of attention? Got a short little span of attention. Oh, my nights are so long, where's my wife and my family? What if I die here, will it be my role model? Now that my role model is gone, gone. Duck back down the alleyway with some rolling poor little bad face girl. All along, along, there were incidents and accidents, there were hints and allegations. You be my bodyguard, I can be your long lost pal. I could call you Betty, Betty, when you call me, you could call me. Call me out. Street. It's a street in a strange world. Maybe it's a third world. Maybe it's his first time around. Doesn't speak the language. He holds no currency. He is a foreign man. He's surrounded by the sound, sound. Kettle in the marketplace. Scatterings in orphanages. He looks around, around. He sees angels in the architecture. Spinning in infinity. He says, Amen and Hallelujah. You'll be my bodyguard. I can be Lost pal, I could call you Betty. Betty, when you call me, you could call me. Call me out, na 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 Thank you. 
you so much, ladies and gentlemen. That's Matt, that's Kyle, that's Andy, that's Dale, Bree, Vinny, Andy. My name's George, the Philadelphia Funk Authority, ladies and gentlemen. George Robb, yeah. everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you for supporting live music played by actual human beings.